All right, well, good afternoon. Well, everyone, this is the UCCS Speaker Series. In fact, it's the fifth installment of this fall quarter. Um, and uh, today, as always, our goal is to contribute to the conversation about critical and important issues in California policy, and in particular, to bring the best possible evidence to bear on the problems that confront all of us. In prior sessions this quarter, as some of you know, we've heard Anna Sarah Lobet speak about flood control in the wake of epic fires, Jay Lund on California water management, and just last week, Chris Barker and Nikolai Kendall on mosquito control in pervasive warming climate. What's clear from these talks is that fires and floods and the health problems that result from them uh, are going to be an increasing presence in California but the time and place of their occurrence will never be entirely predictable. So part of being resilient in the face of this kind of unpredictability is having an insurance system that can help spread out the financial risks of catastrophic fire and floods over time and among people. Yet as risks grow, the insurance system can become unstable and premiums can start to exceed what the average Californian can afford. So to talk through some of these issues, we're pleased to introduce two verified experts on the topic. First, Dave Jones, former insurance commissioner of California and current director of the Climate Risk Initiative at uh, UC Berkeley at the Center for Law, Energy, and Environment. Mr. Jones was, uh, com uh, as commissioner, he was responsible for regulating the largest insurance market in the US where insurers collect $310 billion in premiums and have $5.5 trillion in assets under management. Mr. Jones led the department's response to California's increasingly deadly and destructive wildfires, <laughs> including the 2018 Mendocino, Carr, Wolsey, and Camp fires. Prior to serving as commissioner, Mr. Jones was a California State Assembly member, a Sacramento City Council member, and counsel to U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno. In his current job at Berkeley, he leads a program that researches and develops market-based regulatory and policy solutions to assist insurance and financial industries in responding to the risks caused by climate change. Um, sitting next to him, Dr. Michael Peterson is Deputy Commissioner of the Climate and Sustainability Branch of the California Department of Insurance. Um, he uh, leads multiple initiatives to reduce climate risks and strengthen resilience, including work on the California Climate Insurance Working Group, which focuses on resiliency through closing protection gaps and employing nature-based solutions. Dr. Peterson also leads a partnership with the United Nations to develop the California Sustainable Insurance Roadmap. Prior to his current position, he was a policy consultant for the California State Senate where he worked on climate change, natural resources, air quality, and energy issues. Dr. Peterson holds a PhD in environmental science policy and management from UC Berkeley. So we have a strong Berkeley connection today. Um, during today's session, we'll hear from Mr. Jones first, then Dr. Peterson, and then there should be plenty of time for questions for both the in-person and student audiences. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our two speakers today. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction, and thanks all of you for <coughs> taking some time out of your business schedules to uh, hear from Mike and I, and uh, it's a great treat to get to spend some time with you and to share a platform with Deputy Commissioner Mike Peterson. Very appreciative of uh, his leadership, as well as that of Commissioner uh, Ricardo Lara, uh, and um, we've had the opportunity to do some work together uh, at the, the Center for Law, Energy, and Environment, and uh, the Commissioner and uh, the Arvin, so we Greatly appreciate the partnership, and I'm going to be setting a little bit of the uh, uh, stage uh, with regard to what's happening globally, what's happening in the U.S., uh, and what's happening in California and Florida uh, as case studies for the impact of climate change on insurance markets, <coughs> and talk a little bit about some solutions, and I believe Mike is going to um, speak directly to um the commissioner's sustainable insurance plan and some of the recommendations the commissioners made recently as well. So just to begin, um, 
Unfortunately, the failure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions means the temperature increase will exceed the um, objective of keeping temperature rise below two degrees Celsius globally. Um, we just had the National Climate Assessment come out yesterday. There have been a series of recent other studies released by the UN and other scientists. We're just not doing enough fast enough. California's been a leader. Um, the governor and legislature have done some terrific work, uh, but what's happening is other states are not following suit. The United States continues to lag behind and countries across the globe lag behind. What we also know is that uh, global temperature rise and temperature rise um, in the United States is contributing to more frequent and severe weather related events. So think um, wildfire, drought, um, heat islands, um, convective storms, hurricanes, you know, the list of and parade of these um, perils and risks, uh, and weather related events that are being driven by climate change. And that's adding to more deaths, injuries, property damage, destruction, and also having an impact on insurers as they see increased losses. The other contributing factor is growth of population, growth of businesses and economic activity, and growth of values at risk in areas that are being impacted by climate change. So that's also contributing to both economic and insured losses. What's happening in California is not unique. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's occurring across the globe. And I believe we're marching steadily towards an uninsurable future because we're not acting aggressively and fast enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Just a little bit of uh, background in terms of what's happening globally. This is a graph that shows um, insured losses globally since 1970. You can see what the trend is, it's up. Um, significantly, you know, with some variation in recent years from year to year. Um, but uh, in 2021, for example, you know, the total global insured losses was over $100 billion. Um, insured losses are a subset of overall economic losses. Economic losses tend to be in order of magnitude at least a third or half higher because there is an insurance protection gap. Um, but the trend is not good. Um, climate change is driving more frequent severe weather events that are causing more insured losses across the globe. Um, further to this, in the United States, if you just look at the United States, this is a, a graph over time with regard to the number of billion dollar disaster events annually in the United States, um, CPI adjusted. Uh, so in 2023, uh, we have reached $25 billion disaster events alone. Um, and you can see the graph line shows what the five-year average is. Um, and the trend is up. I mean, there's some variation year to year. But sadly, we're seeing more weather-related disasters across the United States um, as a result uh, significantly of climate change. This is just billion-dollar weather and climate disasters in the United States in 2023 alone. If you looked at these charts from NOAA from year to year, what you'll see is that, well, it looks like there's some concentration in the middle of the United States. Uh, you know, we've had a good year with regard to wildfire in the West, so you don't see as many uh, disasters there this year. Uh, but in years past, there were a lot of over billion dollar events in California and Washington, Oregon, and throughout the Western United States. So fundamentally, there really is no place in the United States that fr is free from the impact of climate-driven events as it relates to weather-related events. You might recall that you know Vermont was long thought of as a potential climate refuge, and then what happened the other year, severe flooding that caused loss of life, damage of property, and significant insurance losses. So drilling down to California, um, you know, we have a number of different risks, but I think the one that's most top of mind is wildfire. And this is just a graph that shows the growth uh, in acres burned as a measure of the increased um, incidents and spread of wildfire in California. Again, there's some variance year to year, uh, 2022, 2023. Um, we had a slightly better year, but the trend line is up and likely to continue up because we're not doing enough to drive down global temperatures by releasing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you look at it from the perspective of insurance losses in California, this is actually a chart that shows wildfire-related U.S. insurance losses, but most of these losses are driven by wildfires in California, particularly the 2017 and 2018 losses. So in 2017, insurers lost over $15 billion. 
um, as a result of major fires, principally in California. And again, in, in 2018, um, lost uh, $13 billion in insurance payouts, again, principally because of uh, wildfires in California. So the trend line with regard to the climate-driven risks in California uh, is negative. Um, and we're going to see an increased incidence, not only of wildfire, but wildfire-related losses, sadly, because we're not doing enough related to climate change. Um, now, this chart takes a look at what impact there's been on insurance company profitability. And um, the green bars reflect positive profitability. The red bars reflect um, negative profitability. And if you look from about 2004 till about 2017, um, insurers had uh, underwriting profits. Um, and then we're hit in 2017 by the enormous losses of the California wildfires, and again in 2018, uh, where their losses were um, extraordinary uh, and also had a major impact on their profitability. Now, if you look, this is the latest chart that I was able to find. If you look at 2022, 2023, um, the incidence of wildfire and insurance losses in California has decreased, and so the companies are um, certainly uh, at or above profitability in these last two years. But again, the trend is not positive. Um, one particular way of thinking about this is um, also factoring in the ability of insurers to recover some of those losses, particularly as it relates to utility costs, wildfires. So this particular chart was uh, developed by Consumer Watchdog, which is a consumer advocacy group, uh, to point out that, in fact, um, after you factor in the insurer's ability to stand in the shoes of those that they paid insurance to and then make claims against the utilities that started those wildfires in 2017 and 2018, what's known as subrogation. So they have a right of subrogation, which means that they're able to stand in the shoes of those that they're paying to and then bring a claim on their behalf against whoever started the wildfire, in this case, utilities. So insurers were paid out about $11 billion or so from uh, the PGE settlement and other settlements. So that actually um, provided some considerable benefit. What this graph shows is what's called the loss ratio, which is basically the percentage of premium that's dedicated to covering the losses that the insurer pays out. So you want this to be below 100% if you're an insurance company. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be paying out more than 100% of your premium. As you can see in 2017 and 2018, they were paying out more than 100% of the premium they collected, but some of that was mitigated by their recovery of uh, and recouping of those losses uh, through uh, actions against the utilities. So all of this is landing now in California uh, in the following ways. Uh, what we've been seeing for some time is insurers deciding on a home by home basis not to renew insurance for those homes that they conclude face too high a level of wildfire risk. Some people refer to this as cancellation. It's important to understand that insurance contracts are actually one year contracts. So the companies have the discretion to non renew um, and they have basically unfettered discretion. And increasingly, what uh, companies in California and throughout the United States are doing is they're adopting risk score models that allow them to assign risk scores to individual homes based on the risk of a particular peril that home might face in the case of California wildfire risk. And then deciding that for some homes in some locations, it's simply too risky to insure that home. Um, and so they're declining to renew. And so this chart goes to about 2021. It shows collectively between insurance and consumer initiated renewals um, about uh, a million uh, non-renewables. That trend has increased in 2022 and 2023 as well. So we're seeing more insurers choosing not to renew because they think the risk is too great. Um, what we're seeing at the same time too is that more policyholders in California are being forced to go to the FAIR plan. The FAIR plan is the fire insurer of last resort, uh, which was established by the California legislature and governor some 40 years ago or so. It's a involuntary association of all the insurance companies that are writing home insurance in the state of California, and it writes a fire insurance policy. Um, and 
you're eligible to get that fire insurance policy if you can't obtain insurance on the private market. And so what we're seeing year to year is a significant increase in the policy count of the fair plan as individual homeowners and condominium owners, in some cases renters and businesses are being told by the private insurer, we're not gonna renew you or we're not gonna write new insurance for you. And so they have to go to the fair plan. Um, and these numbers have continued to rise in 2022 and 2023, um, so that um, as, the latest, as late as 2021, about 3% of the total homeowners market was being written by the fair plan. Now that has risen to about 4%. And those numbers continue to rise as insurance companies are saying, look, it's too risky for me to renew your insurance. I'm not going to renew you. And it's pushing people onto the fair plan. So this is one indicator of the challenge we're facing. And this trend line is going to continue to go up again as insurers conclude it's too risky to write insurance, to renew insurance. In fact, in California, we've had um, not only insurers decide on a case by case not to renew, but some number of insurance companies, roughly five or so, have said, we're not going to write new insurance, and we're going to cap, or we're going to cap the amount of insurance we're writing. So State Farm, Farmers, a couple of the other companies, who are major companies here, have in various ways concluded that they're just too exposed to loss in California. And so they're going to not only non-renew selectively, but they're also not going to write new insurance policies as well. So that's going to have the effect of pushing more people on to yeah. the fair plan. I'll note parenthetically that there are about 35 states that have fair plans, and this story in California is being repeated to various extents across the United States. We're seeing fair plan counts go up in other fair plans that other states have as private insurers, based on the peril in that particular location, are deciding they can no longer insure a home, and so they're pushing more people onto the fair plan in that particular state. So another way to think about this is, is what's called the combined ratio, which is basically not only the cost to the insurer in a given year of pay paying out claims, but also their operating costs and costs associated with doing their business. Again, the goal here is to keep that combined ratio below 100%. In 2017, you can see the combined ratio for insurers in California was 241.9%. So they paid out in claims 241.9% of uh, what they were pulling in, both paying out and also their operating costs. Again, in 2018, uh, their combined ratio was 213.4%. It got better in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. But this is another way of looking at the challenges the insurers are facing with regard to their overall profitability. And the 10-year average is 108.1%, which is not a great place for the companies to be. Florida. So lest you think that what's happening in California is unique to California or um, somehow uh, uniquely driven by California insurance market or California policy choices, I think it's important to look at what's happening in some other states. Florida in particular has also um, suffered, but as has Louisiana and Texas and some other Gulf states from climate-driven perils, particularly wind losses. Um, so the important thing to focus on here is the orange line, uh, which is in 2022 um, losses, uh, billion dollar disaster events in, in Florida rose to over $110 billion, um, actually about $112 billion associated with wind. And each of those colored lines reflects a, a year, and so you can see it's going up. Um, what's happening in Florida is the same thing in California. They also have a fair plan, which is called Citizens Insure, which writes wind insurance. Their policy count has gone up dramatically as private insurers in Florida decided they can't write home insurance any longer. And their policy count is now at about 1.3 million uh, in 2023. Um, what has Florida done in response? Well, they've allowed forward-looking probabilistic models to set prices. <clears throat> they allow reinsurance costs to be included in rates. They've limited the ability of a homeowner to assign their benefits to a third party that can then bring a lawsuit against the insurance company. They've eliminated one-way attorney fees. They've created a public reinsurance facility. They have a setup where the Florida Citizens Insurance Last Resort Insurer can assess all Florida policyholders if there's a reserve shortfall. The rates are about three times the national average, and they've begun to try to depopulate their insurer of last resort, try to move some of that risk back to the insurers. So these are very um, uh, important uh, policy responses by Florida to try to address their, their crisis. What's happened is that um, you can see 
with this chart, uh, it shows their uh, net under net income and net underwriting losses, which has basically been negative until just this last quarter, where it's slightly gone positive, which is good news for Florida. However, even though there has been some recent uh, improvement, you know, it is important to note that their insurer of last resort before they began depopulating had about 1.3 million policyholders. Farmers and five other insurers have pulled out of Florida market entirely. 15 companies have stopped writing new insurance. Seven companies in Saul and 18 companies are on their DOI watch list. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that there are policy interventions that can make a difference. It might make a difference. But the problem is that those are um, potentially being washed out by the overall rise in risk being driven by climate change, um, which is continuing to increase. So remains to be seen whether all these Florida policy changes will actually have a dramatic effect, but it continues to be a very, very challenged market. So how do we stop the march towards an unsurable future? One is we got to act faster to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think that is the primary driver here. The other is we've got to disincentivize or stop putting more people and businesses into harm's way. One of the drivers of the insurer's losses is that we've increased population, increased business activity, increased values in areas that are being impacted by climate change. So that has an impact on insurers and insurance losses. And so we've got to think about how do we grow in a way that's more sustainable? Improving and enforcing building codes and land use requirements to mitigate risk. Investing in nature-based mitigation. There are proven investments in nature that reduce risk. One is increasing uh, forest management to decrease severe wildfire risk. The other is nature-based approaches to reducing flood risk by setting back levees and bypasses. Replanting salt marshes, it turns out, reduces coastal flood risk, so investing more in that. Um, giving the fair plan the authority to issue bonds to cover losses which exceed its reserves as a way of trying to spread out um, its potential uh, losses and also improving the clearinghouse program, which is set up to try to create an opportunity for insurers to then move policies off the fair plan and back into the private market, potentially amending the catastrophe factor in rates. So giving insurers more rate associated with these catastrophes. Um, something insurers can do is stop insuring fossil fuels and stop investing $569 billion in the industry that is actually causing temperatures to rise, causing more losses and making it more challenging for insurers. Um, another is that it would be helpful if insurance underwriting models and pricing models account accounted for some of these nature-based investments. With few exceptions, they don't. Um, giving the department more money so that it can more uh, quickly review rate filings by insurers to turn those around more quickly. And then something called climate risk stress testing, which is something that our center is partnered with the uh, department on, which is a tool that looks at the stress that the insurance company faces vis-a-vis -vis climate change. These are all things that I think could help. Uh, but again, I come back to fundamentally, we've got to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to reduce the drivers for temperature increase. I just want to do a deep dive on, on one particular reform. I think it's, it's important to note that there is a, a proven mitigation, empirically proven mitigation that can make a difference in terms of reducing deaths, property loss, and insurance losses, and that is better forest management. And that is basically replicating what nature did before we started the last 130 years of suppressing all fires in forest. Uh, fires used to be a normal part of the ecology of our Western forests. They would burn out lower undergrowth that would burn out what are called ladder fuels, which are smaller trees. Forests used to be characterized in the West by more open space. And as a result, fire would stay on the ground, not get up into the crowns of trees. So the good news is that um, we're making significant investments in forest treatment in California and across the West. The problem is that insurance underwriting models, the models they use to decide whether to write insurance and their rates don't account for the risk reduction benefits of forest Management. That's something that I think needs to be changed. Um, as I said a moment ago, I mean, the governor set a goal of a million acres a year. California is investing about 2.7 billion. Um, the federal government nationwide has put 5 billion into better managing lands to try to reduce the risk of, of wildfire. And then local governments, tribes, NGOs, homeowners associations are all in various ways doing forest management. We need to do more of it, but unfortunately, it's not being accounted for in the very models insurers are using to decide whether to write insurance. And that's frustrating for communities and for the state that's investing in, in forest management. So the solution would be to have these underwriting models and rates account for the risk reduction benefits of forest management, creates a virtuous circle and encourages more public investment in forest management, 
if the communities can see some benefit in terms of insurance availability. So that was quick, I know, <laughs> a lot to consume. Um, but I guess the, the um, point that I would like to leave you with is that, um, the points is one, what's happening in California is not unique. It's happening across the globe. Various levels of acuity, it's landing in different ways in different parts of the United States and across the globe with greater or lesser acuity. The climate change is driving these losses. Two, we're not doing enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions fast enough. So we're gonna to continue to see temperatures rise. We're gonna see losses go up. Three, there are some policy interventions and Mike's gonna get into some of those as well in a moment that can make a difference. And we ought to consider those, uh, including the ones that, that I shared with you. Um, but we may be reaching a point where the climate-driven impacts uh, and losses are so acute that there's not going to be uh, a magic wand in, term of, in terms of policy changes that's going to enable insurance at any price uh, to be available in certain parts of the United States. And so that is what I'd like us to take us back to is what is the underlying risk driver and why we need to continue to focus there. So thanks for your kind attention. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Dave. Really appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mike Peterson. I'm the Deputy Commissioner on Climate Sustainability at the California Department of Insurance. It's good to be with you today. Um, I thought a lot about how to uh, segue smoothly from um, what former Commissioner Jones laid out in terms of the current situation we see nationally in California and into like where we are as a uh, department and, and looking at forward looking solutions. And so my boss, boss and insurance commissioner Ricardo Lara has put a lot of time into building the partnerships both with academics, but also with jurisdictions that range from the, the international down to the local. And so I want to just put our, our solutions in that context. And where that starts for me is that we spent two years working with the UN. Um, they have a, a principles of sustainable insurance initiative on what does a roadmap look like for California? As you'll appreciate within that roadmap, you can embed research projects, policy solutions, monitoring exercises, new rules, revisions of old rules. But I think it gives a good framework for where I'll end, which is our solutions moving forward. And to give you just you know, the, the through line here, when we look at insurance, insurance has historically been focused on how do we recover from events? What is the funding that helps a community recover after a wildfire, after a storm, after a heat event, after a cold snap? And moving that frame from just the recovery to also before the storm, before the fire, before the heat, before the cold, what are the risk reduction interventions we can make that lessen the impacts on those communities after the fact. Resilience is always gonna be one part risk reduction, one part recovery. How do we move to earlier action so we can protect as many people as possible and not leave people behind as insurance operates? So with that, I will move to my first slide here. So there's four, there's four main goals of our sustainable insurance roadmap that we worked on with the UN. The first, just like Dave underscored, is that Reducing greenhouse gas emissions in every sector of the economy is essential. The uh, strongest long-term path to resilience is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and bring down um, the overall projection of um, temperature increase and the resulting impacts uh, in, throughout the country. Secondly, um, and this one I'll pause on for a moment, is that the protection gap has been widening. And this is the gap between the total costs of an event all the losses from a wildfire, a flood, or a heat wave, and those that are covered by insurance. And so as that gap widens, that means more and more of the costs are falling on individual households, individuals themselves, local government safety nets. Um, and, and that's going to have disparate impacts on vulnerable communities. So if we can close protection gaps for vulnerable communities, not only will that embed more risk reduction, but it will also mean that there are, are stronger, more equitable recoveries from climate impacts. Third, keeping insurance available and affordable. And this is really gonna take a comprehensive set of solutions that is dependent on the specific peril that we're talking about. So in California, we have a very publicized risk of wildfire losses. We have a real 
but less publicized risk of flood losses. We have a record setting heat waves. We had record setting snowmelt last year. We have record setting drought. There's a lot of issues that are upstream of is insurance available and is it affordable? And so we're really trying to look at those core issues that lead to insurance availability and affordability and how we can use public policy to make um, insurance better available to people. And then four, creating community protection from climate threats. And on this, we had a very specific initial mission. And that was that in 2019, Commissioner Lara launched the Climate Insurance Working Group, um, which is a group of 18 experts, including environmental NGOs, including public policy experts, including insurance experts, including the department, to come together and come up with recommendations for the insurance commissioner on how to better protect communities from climate threats. It's a great 80 page report. There's 40 recommendations there. I encourage you to read it. But what I really want to stress is that the same three elements keep coming up and that's we're seeing increasing climate risks. We're seeing a widening protection gap and we need to address both of those things to be a truly resilient state. Um, and where that happens is in the risk reduction part of um, what happens in communities, but also in the rules around insurance. Okay, so how are we doing on our sustainable insurance roadmap? Um, we've had a lot of firsts, which is exciting. When you have a climate sustainability branch of the department, which is the only one in the country, um, there's an opportunity to work on a number of new initiatives. But more importantly, we've, um, I'm sorry, I'm staring at the same screen here, but I'm gonna point over here. It's a little bit weird, you know, it's like basketball. <laughs> um, but as we, as we go through different categories that we're trying to, to achieve, um, we really are looking on not only what's the first of its kind, but also what's enduring. And so um, the first action that, that we've um, really pursued is to strengthen transparency and financial oversight. That's a key role of the department. And so we've moved um, the uh, other state regulators across the, the country towards a stronger level of climate risk disclosure by insurance companies. So back in 2019, there were six states implementing what we call our climate risk disclosure survey. Now there are 27. It covers 85% of the market. And that's going to continue and be enduring. And we're going to hope to grow that more and more and really be a national leader on disclosing the climate risks that insurance companies are taking. Um, secondly, uh, transitioning to more sustainable investment strategies. So under Commissioner Jones, he launched the uh, Climate Risk Carbon Initiative. We've continued to work on studying and reporting insurer investments in not just fossil fuels, but also in green bonds and more sustainable bonds. Um, third, we're trying to catalyze sustainable insurance products. And that means partnering with local governments, trying to design what is it that at the community level we can do to make insurance more available in a particular community. And then fourth, when we're creating resilient communities, um, we really need to not just think about what's on the front page of paper, which is wildfire, but also on flooding and extreme heat. In the state right now, we estimate that there are 2% of households that have flood insurance. That means 98% of the cost from the floods we've seen this year, whether it's hurricanes, snow melt, atmospheric river, rising um, riverine flooding, um, those costs are falling on individuals. And so where can we be more resilient on flooding? And then on extreme heat, we have a really exciting new endeavor at the state level. Um, Commissioner Lara sponsored legislation to create the first ever extreme heat ranking tool. And what that means is that we have a vocabulary around fires and flooding and hurricanes. We name them, we rank them. Um, uh, the Weather Channel you know, is able to express that information. For heat waves, we've never had a really, like I'd say, um, clear tool on how to warn people of how to prepare for heat waves. And so the state's now, right now, um, developing the first ever uh, extreme heat ranking tool for the state. It incorporates not just meteorology, but also health impacts. And so it's gonna be a very powerful planning tool and warning tool moving forward. Since we're at the UC Center, I wanted to highlight UC partnerships. And I'll, I'll take, take a moment here because I think this is actually a really great opportunity for the future as well as today. So since 2019, we've partnered with UC Merced on wildfire risk assessments. We've partnered with UC Santa Cruz on coastal resilience and insurance. We are currently in a partnership with UC Davis on flood resilience and insurance in the Delta, um, some of the legacy communities that have um, very high flood risk and very um, low income and ability to address that risk directly. 
And then with UC Berkeley, we had um, two, I'd say, first of their kind reports, one on uh, exploring the policy levers and legal questions related to ensuring extreme risks. This is a new area that isn't historically uh, insured. Uh, that report came out in 2020. And then just this last spring, um, working with the Center on Law, Energy, and the Environment, um, we came out with a, they, they published uh, a report that we commissioned on uh, what we call the Scenario Analysis Design Guide. And so they mentioned that stress testing of insurance companies um, is an important uh, sort of forward-looking financial surveillance tool. This is a design guide that's not only going to help us figure out how to pursue that, but it's going to help every state in the U.S. that's whose insurance commissioner is considering how climate risks are affecting insurance companies also look at what options are there, what decisions are there. So I want to highlight this because I really see this as the department's research engine. We have a, an amazing department of actuaries and, and enforcement agents in fraud prevention and rate review. Um, risk research is not something that we can do alone. And so partnering with universities like the UC system has given us an opportunity to understand risks in a different way. And what that means is we can go all the way kind of from start to finish. We can understand how better to assess risks, how better to communicate those risks, how better to reduce the risks, and then what insurance solutions address the, the remaining risk um, once you've gone through those steps. Um, and I'm just really proud of the research engine that we've developed. And it's now part of our um, framework moving forward. So if you've got good insurance ideas, please um, please raise them with me because it is something that we see as a major partnership. Okay, so on insurance rules, what have we done? Um, in October of 2022, Commissioner Waller finalized what we call the Save It From Wildfires, Wildfire Mitigation Regulations. Um, and what that means is that insurance companies are now required to provide incentives for home hardening and community uh, mitigation designations um, in how they develop their premiums that people are charged. So think about that. We've had wildfire in the state for thousands of years. We've had a Department of Insurance since the 1860s. But insurance companies weren't required to reward homeowners for reducing the risks to their property in a really specific way. Some companies did, some companies different did, didn't. This makes it a systematic process across the state. And what that means is that you can go as a policyholder and look at a common list of here are the six things you do to your structure to reduce the risk to that structure. Here are the three things that you can do to protect the immediate surroundings. <clears throat> And then here are the two different designations that your community can pursue. And each of those, an insurance company has to consider what they charge you. Now, what makes this really impactful is that the way we did this was to bring together the state's, I'd, I'd say, wildfire response and emergency agencies so that we could come up with a consensus list that now is consensus across all the agencies. So that's CAL FIRE, the California Office of Emergency Services, the Public Utilities Commission, and the governor's office of planning and research. And so what this should do is it means that insurance companies are incentivizing 11 factors. When Cal Fire looks at grant programs, they're gonna um, have complementary factors that they're providing grants to low and moderate income um, homeowners. When the PUC looks at what they're looking at, you're going to find consistency and that's really helpful for, for government. So right now, these, this regulation is being implemented. Insurance companies were required to submit rate fines that included it in April. Those rates um, are being reviewed um, and approved after scrutiny. And so these, um, these incentives will be going into effect soon. OK, so where are we going from here? So if, if the Saver from Wildfires is what we have completed and it's being implemented and it focuses on risk reduction, um, what is our forward-looking strategy um, as a department? In late September, uh, Commissioner Lara announced the California Sustainable Insurance Strategy and has three interlocking goals. One, um, to promote accessible insurance for Californians. Two, to create a resilient insurance market. And really, that you would think about that, that's a, a market that's stable even in the face of climate risks. And three, protecting communities from climate change, which means embedding risk reduction and everything that we do. So th these are the department's um, new goals. In response to this, the admitted insurance sector has committed to writing more policies in wildfire distress communities in the state, um, at least 85% of those communities. And so what our intent is for this to accomplish is that, as uh, former Commissioner Jones 
you know, noted, we've seen an increase in fair claim policies over the last five years. We need to reverse that. And in order to reverse that, we're going to be looking at new rules um, related to wildfire risk assessment, which includes looking at catastrophe models and rules um, around those in rate filings. Because if an insurance company isn't able to um, accurately assess the risk of what they're writing, they're going to retract from writing in those areas. And we've seen that seven of the top 12 companies have changed their underwriting to um, retract where they write from high risk areas. And if you think about the whole state, 12 companies write 85% of the policies in the state. So if seven of 12 are making those decisions, that is having an impact um, and a disruptive impact on consumers, their communities, and how they plan for their future. Um, we're also going to be relooking at rules that the department's had um, for, in some cases, for decades, and, and figuring out how to have a more focused approach to rate filings so that they can be processed um, with scrutiny, um, that rates can be justified, but more efficiently and with a more focused approach so that insurance companies can expect to get their rate filings through the department's review process um, in a, an amount of time that fits with writing more in areas uh, that we want to see them write more. And we're going to be able to monitor this because the department's developed um, a, an ability to um, uh, collect and review data from insurance companies to not only look at what's happening with the fair plan, but what's happening um, uh, zip code by zip code, county by county, in terms of new policies, renewed policies, and non-renewed policies. And so if we aggregate that information, we can monitor how the strategy um, is uh, progressing moving forward. And then I want to really underscore the last, um, the, low, the final line here on the slide, not the lowest, it's equivalent to the other two, but protecting communities from climate change. We're really focused on how do you incorporate risk reduction to every aspect of insurance um, regulation. And so as we look at risk assessments, as we look at catastrophe models, we're going to be really looking at how do we get all the different levels of risk reduction reflected in those um, approaches so that there is um, an incentive to, to reduce risk, but also that when communities make efforts, their efforts are rewarded. Um, and that's gonna create a cycle that, um, that we hope will um, uh, create a more stable insurance market moving forward and reverse that growth in the fair plan. I know we uh, talked a bit about wildfires, but I wanna end with talking about atmospheric rivers. I mentioned earlier that only 2% of households in the state have flood insurance. We've seen just in the last year, um, major atmospheric rivers here in Sacramento, um, major storms along the coast, uh, and major snowfall, fall, snow melt that has affected farms in the Central Valley. So when we look at how to prepare for these, um, we're looking at a future where atmospheric rivers become more impactful because either they're slowing down as they're moving over populated areas, or they're holding more water. And that's gonna mean more flooding in areas that currently don't have insurance. So similar to how we're approaching the sustainable insurance strategy, which is how do we get insurance availability to more communities that don't have it? We're trying to take the same approach when it comes to flood insurance. How do we expand flood insurance um, to communities that currently don't have it and, and could be seeking it? And I want to put up one bit of research from UC San Diego. Since I didn't mention them on the previous slide, we're going to have a UC San Diego um, note here. Um, because I think it's really important. And it also helps me kind of give a visual of why it's so essential for our insurance regulator here in California to work with other state regulators across the nation. And that is that when you look at the flood losses that we measure in the Western states, Nearly all flood losses in those Pacific Coast areas are driven by atmospheric rivers. This was a study done, um, like I said, by UC San Diego researchers. They looked at flood losses from 1970 to 2017. So that doesn't even incorporate the climate change impacts we're <coughs> projecting to see in the next 10 years, the next 20 years. Nearly 85% of all those flood losses were from atmospheric rivers, over 95% in, in many areas. And if you look here at coastal Washington, coastal Oregon, coastal California. If this map included coastal Alaska, it would be very similar. If it included Hawaii, it would also be similar. And so if you think of, we have a flood insurance challenge because of the 2% um, access to flood insurance. 
how do we address that? Well, one, we want to expand insurance options, but two, we have like a really specific type of flood risk for some of these communities. And so this really is an opportunity to accelerate risk mitigation for these types of events. And that means uh, looking at how we manage watersheds, uh, our investment in nature-based solutions like wetlands, coastal marshes, um, uh, riparian areas that um, run along streams and creeks. Um, this is really an opportunity to tackle a lot of losses um, looking at one particular area. And similar to what I mentioned with extreme heat, we're just developing the vocabulary for these atmospheric rivers. There's just been scientists who are starting to try to propose ranking systems and then use those ranking systems to inform local risk mitigation priorities. And so I really think that when we look at the insurance challenges of the state, it's both wildfire and flooding, and that th this type of information links universities to what could be really helpful to policymakers. So I'll, I'll end here um, with just sort of our key next steps. We have a sustainable insurance strategy that Commissioner Miller is pursuing. That's going to involve um, adding new rules in places, revisiting old rules in others. Um, it's going to involve a ton of monitoring <coughs> on where insurance policies are accessible and where they're not, and, and expanding that access. Um, but there are three other pieces that I want to mention. One is that we're continuing to build what we call climate insurance pilot projects. And that means that if you have an area that's at a high risk, insurance is not available in that area on an individual home by home basis, is there an opportunity for the entire community to have a basic level of insurance and combine that with their community risk reduction that they're investing in? And so we've proposed pilot pro projects across the state for heat, for flood, for fire that are informed by examples in New York City and in around the world that come from the UN and we'll be um, continuing to publish outside those as we have more information. Uh, secondly, um, we're both a financial regulator and a market regulator. And so much of what I've talked about today is how do you expand insurance availability for the people who need it? There's also a responsibility for the um, department to monitor the solvency risks to companies because ultimately these companies have made promises to pay an insurance claim if it's ever needed and, and triggered. So when we think about climate risks, we have to think about how to look at scenarios both for solvency questions and for insurance availability questions. And some of those tools were just, um, I'd, I'd say, expanding and refining and ready to use now. And then third, I only got to mention briefly, Dave mentioned his talk, but there's a huge link here to nature-based solutions. The way we manage wetlands and forests is absolutely crucial to the availability of insurance, but it's really challenging to measure on a locally tailored area. And so we've tried to work with universities on the research part of this. We've sponsored legislation to create climate resilience districts that can focus on their local risks and the nature-based solutions in those areas. But this is an area where I really am excited to continue to partner with, um, with stakeholders and researchers, because if we can link the benefits of wetlands and forest management to insurability, that can be a very powerful pathway to make insurance available and affordable um, and sustainable for the long run in the state. So I'll leave you there. Really appreciate your time and uh, thanks so much for having me. Honorable Dave Jones, as well as Dr. Mike Peterson for an amazing talk today. And I'm going to go ahead and let Brooke stop the recording and we're going to go ahead.